really successful mission, so much so that uh, these folks will tell you about all the additional tests that they were able to run. What is the significance of this after a half century that we were last on the moon? There we did the impossible, making it possible. Now we are doing that again, but for a different purpose. Because this time we go back to the moon to learn to live, to work, to invent, to create in order to go on out into the cosmos to further explore. The plan is to get ready to go with humans to Mars late in the decade of the 2030s and then even further beyond. And we know from what we are finding from the James Webb Space Telescope that it is a very, very large universe out there to be understood and explored. And so this is a great day, not only for America, but it's a great day for all of our international partners. That's a difference from 50 years ago. 50 years ago, we went as a country, as a government. Today, we go with not only international partners, but also commercial partners. And so uh, it is the beginning of the new beginning, and that is to explore the heavens. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you. And now Vanessa Weish. Well, thank you. You know, Administrator Nelson and I completely agree with you. This mission was just, you know, flawless. Uh, just cannot uh, thank our teams enough. You know, our teams here at Johnson Space Center, along with our other uh, sister centers across NASA and NASA headquarters, uh, it took all of us to make this mission possible. Uh, here at NASA's Johnson Space Center, I'm just so very proud and thankful of our flight control team that did a wonderful job um, making sure that this uh, vehicle was able to do all of the maneuvers, to go outbound, uh, to do its flyby, to go further away uh, than any other human rated spacecraft, and then uh, to come back. Um, that takes a lot of different people to make that happen. Uh, so I also want to congratulate our Orion program led by Howard Hugh and all of the people that are a part of that, as you mentioned, Lockheed Martin, as well as ESA uh, and Glenn Research Center, and then supporting them right here at Johnson, our great engineering team, our human health and performance team, our safety mission and assurance teams, as well as our teams that support our systems engineering and integration that help with the beginning plans, architectures uh, that were part of making all of this possible. And then the testing that's being done and has been done. And I also want to thank our teams out at White Sands who are continuing to do testing for Orion. Um, this mission is a great success for us. Uh, right now, this tells us that this spacecraft has the outer bones and everything that it needs. So now we are going to go and finish outfitting it uh, so that we can put humans on board on Artemis II. And that's, uh, for us, a big, big deal because we'll put our astronauts on board. And so uh, we're very much looking forward to that. And I just want to say again, congratulations to the entire team. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks, Vanessa. Next up, we have Janet Petro joining us from Kennedy. Hey, good afternoon. And uh, it really is great to be here with you all today. You know, Kennedy Space Center was there at the very beginning of this journey um, with uh, Charlie Blackwell Thompson as a launch director. Um, and here we are at the end of the mission. I think you're going to hear from uh, Melissa Jones, who is the uh, recovery uh, team uh, lead from the Exploration Ground Systems uh, here at KSC as well. Um, you know, and, and, and that launch campaign was not easy. Uh, there were a lot of setbacks, but the uh, collective team really relentless, relentlessly uh, uh, pursued getting that launch off. And um, the entire Space Coast was lit up, up as uh, SLS and Orion took off. Uh, and we watched, uh, we watched in awe, and then we followed the vehicle as it made its journey around the moon. 
Uh, and we held our breath all morning long as uh, Orion did, went through its uh, deorbit and splash down um, paces. It really was uh, surreal. We all talked about it being a, a test mission, but I think this uh, a vehicle and the performance uh, really exceeded all our um, expectations. Uh, I'm really looking forward to getting Orion back at Kennedy uh, at the end of this month uh, in a few short weeks uh, where we'll uh, bring it back into the processing facility, take out the uh, remaining payloads and, and, and service it, deservice it, uh, and then take a really good look at the uh, heat shield and, and see how that system performs. But, um, you know, I got to say it is uh, Kennedy Space Center's 60th anniversary and the administrator kind of talked about the the previous 50, 60 years, all about Apollo and shuttle. And uh, this is really capping off our diamond anniversary at, uh, at Kennedy as we look forward to the next 60 years and everything that Artemis is going to be um, uh, doing for our future here at the agency. So thank you very much. What a way to cap off an excellent year. Um, next up, we have Jim Free. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, good afternoon, and what, what a great day. You know, two pictures from this week that sum it up for me, an empty mobile launcher rolling back and that spacecraft uh, in the water there in the Pacific. So um, a remarkable mission by every single one involved. Congratulations to folks that have worked on this for years, uh, some people their whole career, some people half of their career. Um, it's great to see uh, this first flight uh, come to a close so we can move on down our path of uh, our sustainable presence at the moon. You'll hear a lot about Artemis 1 and things we did on the vehicle in this flight and still have data re to review, but we definitely pushed this vehicle far so that we can be now on to Artemis 2, which is happening today at Kennedy. Uh, the, the, the crew modules there, the ser service modules there, uh, the engine section arrived yesterday. Um, that vehicle is a reality. and. Uh, Ironically, so are the next missions all the way out through Artemis 5. We have hardware today in work around the world through Artemis 5. This isn't just a one flight and we're done. We are on our path to getting that base on the moon, to getting the understanding we need to go on to Mars, and doing the science that's front and center here in our program. Uh, these missions are complex. We talked a lot about that at the beginning. They will become increasingly complex for us. But I think the confidence that we learned in the vehicle, the things that we tested the vehicle to, the way that the teams responded to all that, I think give me great confidence in our path in the future. So it's great to be a part of it. Congratulations to everyone. And I look forward to uh, answering the administrator's questions of when we're going to launch Artemis II. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Over to you, Mike. Oh, well, good afternoon. And uh, thank you to each and every one of you that have um, uh, come to follow us today on a successful completion of the Artemis I mission, but uh, especially to those that followed us from our very first launch attempt and stayed with us through hurricanes and hydrogen leaks and technical issues throughout. Um, this team has really persevered through many challenges, and from the outset we spoke about how this was a deliberate stress test of our deep space human transportation system. And um, it, we've been up front with you about how um, this was going to be a challenging mission. We set some bold priorities. Uh, priority one, demonstrate the vehicle lunar reentry conditions. We successfully demonstrated that today. Priority two, demonstrate the vehicle in the flight environment. We've successfully demonstrated that over the course of a 26-day test flight. <clears throat> priority three is currently in progress. The vehicle is powered down and it's in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and as most, Melissa Jones will elaborate, the vehicle recovery and retrieval is in progress, and we expect to complete that here in the next couple of hours. And then priority four, our bonus objectives, sharing the mission with each and every one of you, uh, public outreach, sharing remarkable images, completing science and technology demonstrations. We've completed that, plus some bonus objectives. So this is what mission success looks like, folks. This was a challenging mission, and this uh, is, is what mission success looks like. Um, one of our, our forefathers in the Apollo program, Hugh Dryden, <clears throat> um, spoke about the purpose of flight testing. And he said it was to separate the real from the imagined and the known from the unknown. And I don't think any one of us could have imagined the mission this successful, but we had a very successful flight test. We now have a foundational deep space transportation system. And while we haven't looked 
at all the data that we've acquired. We will do that over the coming days and weeks and fully understand and appreciate the margins that are there. Um, so um, I'll just say in closure, um, you know, we're sharing a historic day with the Apollo 17 mission and uh, Gene Cernan left a plaque on the surface of the moon and, and I'll paraphrase it here. May the spirit and the peace in which we executed this mission continue forward for all mankind. This mission uh, was a peaceful mission using partnerships from across the industry with our international partners, with our science partners, and, uh, and we're gonna grow out from here. There are more complex and, and more challenging missions ahead, but we've got a foundational capability here. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Jackie. Thanks, Mike. Now over to you, Howard. Thank you, Jackie. Good afternoon, everybody. What a fantastic day uh, for Orion and Artemis. Um, you know, uh, Center Director Weiss said uh, we have a fantastic team. The Orion team uh, would not have been, uh, would have been uh, tremendously happy just getting the data, but uh, this accomplishment that we've been able to do all through this 25 and a half day mission uh, has been so rewarding, uh, and we've been able to get a lot of data. And I want to thank the teams today. Uh, they've worked really hard. You know, the flight operations team uh, has done a tremendous job operating our spacecraft, our engineering team, our safety team, and our, our lead integration uh, team has been tremendous in trying to uh, not only just get the data down, but also looking at the data and adding uh, additional objectives. You know, I'll give you some highlights. You know, we. We were able to uh, be very successful in terms of our, our operating our systems in space, and our return has just been the same in terms of our success. We were able to hit 0 0.02 degrees uh, within what we want to do for our flight path angle, and we landed uh, within 2.1 uh, nautical miles of our target landing site. Our requirement was uh, 5.4 nautical miles, so tremendous success in terms of our return. Of course, we demonstrated six skip entry uh, capability. That went flawlessly as well, and uh, we'll be looking forward to our heat shield data as we gather that and get, learn more about the heat shield performance uh, when we get the capsule back. But overall, uh, the mission has been uh, tremendously successful. We've been able to accomplish uh, over 122 of our uh, flight test objectives that we had planned, and uh, we added a bonus of 20 real-time uh, flight test objectives as well. So great job by the team. Happy to uh, look through the data even more and are ready to accomplish Artemis II uh, going forward. So thank you. Thanks, Howard. And now we have Emily Nelson. You know, this mission, the spacecraft and this team exceeded all expectations. I think we're all in unison on that. Um, the spacecraft per performed so well that we were able to start looking ahead at, at Artemis II and, and thinking through how else can we push the boundaries on this flight? What else can we learn? Where are there constraints that we can push on? Where are there opportunities for us to, to, to improve on our products for the next flight? And so for the last 25 and a half days, we've been every day looking ahead to the next flight to see how we can improve on where we are today so that we can fly a safe and successful mission with our astronauts next time around. Um, the, the team in Mission Control will spend a number of months combing back through every experience that we've had in the last month and uh, improving our products, figuring out what we could do better, figuring out what went well and we want to repeat. And um, meanwhile, in low Earth orbit, we will continue to develop the technologies that are going to make Artemis II, three, four, and sub successful. We'll be installing another rollout solar array, which is a technology that we'll be using on Gateway. We'll be um, continuing to develop some of our more human systems inside of the space station. So our work is, has really just begun, uh, and we're really looking forward to unpacking everything that we had to learn from this space, from this mission, as we prepare for the next one. Thanks, Emily. And now we'll head out to the recovery ship and hear from Melissa Jones. Good afternoon from the U.S. of Portland. It's a beautiful day to be on a ship. Uh, the Orion continues to perform nominally even post splashdown. We just completed our open water hazard assessment of thrusters and RF radiation and all ropes and limits. Um, currently, we're doing some underwater imagery to get some good pictures of the heat shield before we bring it into the the ship and uh, sea states are looking good for well deck operations at this time. So uh, we'll progress with, continue with our, our 
open water operations, we're going to put a collar around the capsule and the ship will approach and we'll attach lines and bring Orion into the ship. And at this time, everything's picture perfect. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, now we'll move into the question and answer portion of our event today. Uh, we'll open it up again to folks on the phone and here in the room. Again, press star one to get into the queue. Our first question is from Marsha Dunn with the Asso Associated Press. Uh, hi, uh, Marsha Dunn at the AP here at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, two timing questions. So Artemis II, uh, we keep hearing 2024. When in the year 2024 might that happen? Can you roll in that date at all to make it quicker? And when will the crew of Artemis II be announced? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and take the, the first question. Uh, we, we've talked always about um, a, a, around two years between Artemis One and Artemis II. Uh, there's still a great deal of work to do on the, uh, the uh, crew module in terms of the hardware installation. I think everybody knows we're taking some of the boxes out of Artemis One, um, <laughs> sending them back for retest, and then uh, putting them into the Artemis II vehicle, then the crew module and service module go together and go through a series of tests. So right now, you know, we're still looking at that two-year time frame from Artemis I to two. I think uh, one thing we've always been concerned about is what do we learn from one and are there changes we have to make? I think we've learned a lot from one. Uh, TBD, if there's changes. Um, so that's some of the work we'll be going through and then kind of get that final assessment on a, on a date for two. But it's, we've always talked about two years between missions. I joked earlier about the administrator asking me about it. Uh, we, we obviously want to try and do it quicker, to your, to your point, Marsha. Um, and Howard and his team uh, on the Orion side are always looking to ways to do things quicker. We're trying to roll in lessons learned from the processing of the Artemis One vehicle at Kennedy. Are there things we can shorten there or optimize? So that's all of our lessons learned path going forward uh, in the near term. I'll turn the second question to Vanessa. Awesome. And so also, uh, Marsha, one of the things that uh, we've been talking about is when to assign the crew, right? And so we knew that we wanted to wait for this mission to go uh, make sure that it was a success. As Jim said, there's still some things that need to be learned as we get the spacecraft back to Florida, make sure that uh, we have everything that we need to know. But uh, our intent is if all is still go and everything looks good, then our plan is to name the crew in early 2023. So we're looking very much forward to that. We're Our, our crews, um, people are anxious, we know that. And so that is our game plan. Thank you very much. That'll certainly be exciting. Next up, we have a question from Gina Sinceri with ABC News. Uh, for every morning, over a decade since you've had the vehicle come down, what was it like to be in mission control for Orion splashing down this morning? Oh, gracious. Um, personally, it, you know, I was talking with Rick LeBrode, our lead flight director, a few times during the day, and and he commented several times that it just hadn't sunk in yet. It just really hadn't sunk in. So I'm going to echo that. It for sure has not sunk in yet. Um, I would also say that coming to work every day for the last 26 days, you've, I feel like any minute now I'm going to get used to walking in and seeing these amazing pictures on the front boards and at, at, the, at the front of Mission Control. This morning we were uh, finishing up some data downloads, and, and so that was using up all of our bandwidth, so we didn't get pictures for a little while. And then suddenly the picture pops up, and it's the most beautiful picture I've seen of Earth as we're coming back to it. And, I mean, it, just awe-inspiring. Like, stunning you know one of us notices it and, and points at the screen and everybody else just pauses for a second to just soak in there's a, a ship that has just been at the moon been farther away than any spacecraft built for humans has ever been and now it's about to splash down in the pacific and we get to be here for this and so it it was certainly a momentous occasion thanks very much next we have a question from bill harwood with cbs news Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, a quick one for Mike Serafin, if I could. Mike, what was the biggest surprise for you during this mission? Uh, something that might have caught you off guard or either happily or unhappily. And you mentioned the Artemis II engine compartment uh, getting here to KSC. Can you talk about the challenge of assembling the core stage in Florida versus Michoud, what that, what that buys you? Thanks. 
Yeah, Bill, uh, thank you for the question. Um, the biggest surprise for me uh, was a positive one, and it was simply that the first time flight of a brand new rocket, a brand new spacecraft, first time operations went as smoothly as it did. And I think that's a testament to the level of preparation, the uh, quality of workmanship, the just the overall uh, level of test and integration and and just effort put into um, getting this mission ready to fly. Um, in terms of uh, bringing the uh, core stage engine section to uh, the uh, Kennedy Space Center, um, you know that is that's an efficiency that we're looking at, um, and and shipping it and then assembling it uh, vertically um, is something that that we've been prepared to do. Um, and the uh, the infrastructure at the Kennedy Space Center affords us an opportunity to do that, as opposed to a horizontal integration at Mishu Assembly Facility um, near New Orleans. Um, the, the work at Mishu is still going to keep going on. We still need to build tanks. We still need to um, build the the large components, and we'll ship the uh, the bulk of the core stage uh, minus the engine section uh, to the Cape, and then made it. Uh, uh, at the uh, at the Cape once it gets there, it actually affords us some efficiency by by splitting the workforce rather than than having competing workforce on the um, on the uh, or competing uh, work uh, instruction priorities on the shop floor at at Mishu. So I think I think it's a good thing, and uh, it's it again is something that we, that we've learned how to uh, integrate one of the more complex systems on the on the core stage. I don't know, Jim, you've been in some of those conversations as well, if you have anything to add on, yeah, on the core stage. Yeah, at, at, at Michoud, we have to um, construct a clean tent around the engine section when we do a lot of the installations or take things off to test. So at Kennedy, we actually, and so you take that up and down, it adds time. At Kennedy, we don't have to do that. We'll, we'll process in the uh, space station processing facility. So we're hopeful that the engine section, which is incredibly complex, uh, will uh, uh, improve in its uh, schedule time. And then uh, the work, Mike mentioned about workforce, uh, you know, we're starting to ramp up the exploration upper stage work at Michu also. So we, we have a lot of work for those folks to do on stuff out through Artemis IV, and we're already starting uh, weld confidence articles and structural articles on the exploration upper stage. So it, it, it helps us with efficiency and uh, hopefully getting to that one year cadence as fast as we can. Thank you both. Next up in the room, we have a question from Eric Berger with Ars Technica. Hi, thanks very much, and, and congratulations on such an impressive flight. I mean, it really was pretty awesome to watch, I think. Um, the first question is for maybe Howard or Mike. On, on the coming back today, it looked like the capsule was kind of swinging back and forth, maybe doing some roll maneuvers, and is that was that as planned? Um, and then second, I guess, for the administrator, um, I think one of the most remarkable things about this moment is that everyone is behind Artemis. You've got the White House, Congress, international allies, traditional space, commercial space, and most of the space advocacy community. I think that's pretty unique, at least since Apollo. And so I'm wondering sort of what you attribute to that universal, almost universal support for what you're trying to do at this point. Oh, I don't, uh, hey, Eric, thanks for the question. Yeah, we do do the roll maneuvers, especially up front on reentry, give us the lift vector. So it'll give us a positive lift, lift vector up when we do the uh, skip entry. And so it's really important. Of course, we will do some roll orientation under the chute so we we'll make sure we land appropriately uh, when we uh, splash down the water as well. Yeah. If, I, I don't know a specific times you're referring to, but we certainly would do uh, some rolls. Yeah. yeah. So I'll elaborate here a little bit, Eric. Um, the center of gravity and the center of lift are slightly offset and the way that you control the lift vector is you rotate one about the other and you can control which direction the vehicle is lifting lifting up lifting down so those were purposeful rolls i i'm familiar and, and recall seeing some of the rolls um when we had a signal between the two blackouts and and that that was per, per the plan and the blackouts were planned we knew that those were coming as well anyway and you had the uh, the support question sir eric the answer to your question is space is the place and um, you you see that uh, you see it in the eyes of children uh, you see it in the interaction of our guys in the blue suits 
our astronauts when they walk into any room, whether it's young or old. Uh, you see it in the technological prowess of the free nations of the world suddenly displaying transparently everything that we are doing. Uh, you see that in a, in a nation that has been riven with partisanship. Uh, that doesn't exist here. NASA is basically nonpartisan. R's and D's alike come together to join us. Uh, and you see that reflected not only in the leadership here, but you see that uh, reflected in the people and the leadership around the world. Um, in the little bit that I've been to Europe, uh, I mean, people are just, uh, to use a phrase, over the moon about our space program. Uh, when I was at the astronomical conference in, um, in Paris, I got a message that the French president wanted to see me. And uh, he's a, a space aficionado, so he just comes last week for a state visit with our president. And where does he want to go? He comes to NASA. Uh, and you see this in also the sense of America accomplishing something that people get excited about. You roll all of that together and a lot more, and that's why you see the excitement in this room today and all across the country. And that's why you saw 60 years ago one half billion people of the earth watching Apollo 11. And that continues today. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Chris Davenport with the Washington Post. Hi, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much. Actually, my question is a, is a follow on that, um, because obviously this is a very big day for NASA, and you have a lot of uh, enthusiasm and momentum for the Artemis program. Uh, but as we know, these successes can sometimes have a very short shelf life. I mean, we saw that with the Apollo program. So I'm wondering if you're concerned about that and how you keep the momentum going uh, with the public and, more importantly, with Congress, especially with that, the fact that the Artemis II mission is not going to come for another two years from now. Thanks very much. Well, Chris, I'm not worried about the support from the Congress. Uh, we will have that. We, in fact, have that. And as I described in my answer to Eric, uh, that support is enduring. Uh, I believe that uh, you're going to see a continued talk about what's going on. When uh, Vanessa announces uh, who's going to be on the crew. I, I think that's going to be uh, an immediate story. And the American people, just like the original seven astronauts in the Mercury days, are going to want to know about these astronauts and how they got to where they are and what is their life like and what it's going to be like as they prepare for this mission. Uh, and I think as we continue to do other things, remember uh, President Kennedy uh, uh, in his speech almost literally 60 years ago at not far from here at the Rice University Stadium said, we go to the moon and do other things, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. And that taps into something in our spirit uh, that we as a people, as a people of free nations, want to see accomplished. And I think that's going to engender the interest that naturally uh, we could be concerned if that interest waned. Thank you. Our next question here in the room. Thank you, uh, Mark Corot with uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology. 
uh, if I heard correctly, um, it sounds like the capsule will go uh, overland to Kennedy. I just wondered um, if there's a a reason for that, like if it's going to stop in between, or it's just don't want to take a chance of putting it on the Super Guppy or something. I I don't know. Thanks. Yeah, I, um, you know, from our perspective, I think we looked at both uh, going on a guppy uh, flying or going on the ground. I think uh, there were maybe a few days, but certainly uh, there was no stops along the way. We're going to try to get the uh, spacecraft back as soon as, as possible. You know, certainly DOT has some um, rules relative to, um, you know, the, uh, transport transporting something like this uh, across the country. Uh, but I know the, the ground team has uh, worked through that already, and they've got a great plan. And we expect, uh, like Janet said, uh, the spacecraft back at KSC very soon. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Joey Roulette with Reuters. Thanks, Jackie. Um, I guess a question for Mike uh, Serafin. Based on the early data that you guys have already and what I guess you saw this morning, is there anything that happened from, you know, service modules Edison all the way to Splashdown that might have looked funny or unexpected that would maybe warrant a closer look? Um, and also, what was the uh, Splashdown speed um, of Iran just before it hit water? Um, and then I also just had one other question uh, for Bill Nelson. You mentioned that the plan is to take humans to Mars by the end of the 2030s. Um, have, has NASA done any actual planning or assessments recently on that date uh, for, for going to Mars? Thanks. Okay, uh, Joey, thank you for the questions. Um, in terms of uh, unexpected items during uh, reentry, I am not tracking any issues associated with the crew and service module separation, the uh, reorientation of the spacecraft into the um, entry interface at, um, um, attitude to get aerodynamic capture, the entire skip profile. Uh, you know, we did have two long blackouts. I, as I recall, they reach about six minutes in duration. Um, we're going to have to look at the uh, post uh, mission data recorders after we get the uh, the capsule back to shore to see if there was anything associated with it. But clearly the vehicle flew um, the uh, the skip reentry just fine. Uh, the entry guidance system uh, was spot on, as Howard indicated earlier, uh, relative to the uh, targeted landing site. We came down within eyesight of the recovery ship, and um, the uh, the vehicle was clean. Uh, post splashdown, the uh, all of the uh, Operating uh, bags uh, that um, protect in the event that the capsule flips over and needs to be uh, uh, automatically uprighted. All five of the uh, the bags inflated and the uh, the vehicle was powered down successfully without any any um, uh, thruster leaks or hazards or anything along those lines. The team did leave as part of one of our flight test objectives. Leave the vehicle powered for two hours post splashdown to gather uh, thermal soak back data as we as we came through the Earth's atmosphere. The vehicle uh, saw temperatures outside of it at uh, nearing 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That soaks back into the vehicle structure. Um, we did collect uh, data by having an extended power up on the, um, on the surface of the ocean. Um, all that was fine. All the parachute deployments were fine. Um, the uh, probably the only thing that that happened that we we expected uh, may happen and, and was likely was the forward bay cover sank in the ocean before we could recover it and the parachutes sank before we could recover those but we knew that that was a possibility um, uh, prior to flight uh, the fact that uh, the, the parachute deployment sequence was was all nominal uh, really makes the uh, the retrieval of the parachutes kind of a moot point so um, you know, in terms of anything unexpected, I would say no. Uh, in terms of the splashdown speed, I didn't get an exact speed, but we were targeting around 20 miles an hour, and that, that appeared to be about what the, uh, the splashdown speed was, but we could follow up with you afterward to get an exact speed. Uh, the goal of going to Mars was first announced by President Obama, and it was thought at the time that it would be about 2033. But that was a dozen years ago. Uh, and now uh, a more realistic goal is the end of the decade of the 2030s. Uh, but 
a lot of this will depend on the development of new technologies, the ability to sustain humans for a long period of time all the way. Uh, part of that uh, is going to be how fast we can get to humans, uh, how fast we can get to Mars with a crew. And uh, so we finally broke through with the Office of Management and Budget on on nuclear thermal propulsion and nuclear electric propulsion uh, research. I think that will be supportive by the Congress. Uh, new technologies to propel us there faster. Uh, and, and so uh, that is why uh, we set a target at, at the end of the decade uh, of the 2030s to go to Mars. And then we're going beyond. Thank you. Our next question is from Micah Maidenberg with the Wall Street Journal. Hi there. Uh, Administrator Nelson, <clears throat> you were, of course, a, a major supporter of the 2010 legislation uh, that was key to getting Artemis I completed. Um, do you feel any sense of, of personal vindication today by the completion of the, the mission? You know, given, especially given the performance of SLS and Orion uh, after some of the technical challenges with the hardware over the years and, and criticism of that bill. Thanks. Uh, the success of the mission today is because of a team like this and all the people that they represent, including our international and commercial partners. Uh, that's why we have come to this extraordinary day today. And uh, I got to go get on a plane and go back to D.C. These guys are going to celebrate. I'm going to miss it. <laughs> Thank you. Our next question comes from Jackie Waddles with CNN. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much, and congratulations. Um, so I thought I remembered last week, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Orion was going to spend like two to three hours in the water, and it sounds like now it's going to spend a bit longer, maybe up to like five or so hours. Um, is that is that true, and why will it be in the water a little bit longer? Um, and then I was also wondering, based on the data you've collected after splashdown, if you could tell us like what exactly the cabin temperature ranges looked like. Thank you so much. Is uh, Melissa still with us? Otherwise, I'll take a crack at that one. Melissa, are you Hey, I'm here. Part of the question dropped out, though. Can somebody repeat it? Her first question was about, or sorry, her second question was about the ta cabin temperature, and the first question was about how long Orion was going to be in the water. She thought she had heard two to three hours, and now it seems maybe more like five or six. So she was looking for confirmation and an explanation on why. Yeah, I can, um, I can answer the first question and we'll have to let somebody else answer the thermal question. So this recovery is about five and a half to six hours and the reason for that is because the first two hours we had a uh, powered up flight test objective with about an hour and a half of imagery. So it's all about gathering data because it's a test flight. Um, and then the last hour and a half to two hours we'll be um, installing a, a collar on it, attaching lines, and getting it in the well deck. So typically, a recovery with crew on board that wasn't required for all of the flight test objective data that we're trying to get, and the flight test objective uh, would be significantly less than this in under two hours. But in this case, we're being very careful, trying to get all the data we can, and trying to be very careful with the capsule when we bring it in and we set it down on the cradle. Thanks, Melissa. I, I, I'll answer the second part. Um, so when we landed, uh, Mike mentioned, you know, understand thermal my, thermal environment in the cabin itself. So it was 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, when I left, uh, you know, after about an hour, it got to about 71 degrees. So really great data, very much in what we expected and a great way to uh, collect the data for this flight and understand how the cabin environment will be for the crew on Artemis II. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Ken Chang with the New York Times. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is for the administrator. Um, so congratulations on today. Looking forward to Artemis III, NASA is working with a company led by Python who today suggested that Anthony Fauci should be prosecuted for crimes. I'm wondering, is there anything that you could say that gives NASA pause on SpaceX's ability to execute conduct? Thank you. 
Hey, Ken, I'm really sorry your, your connection was cutting out in the room. Do you mind repeating your question? Um, can you hear me? It's, it's, it's garbled. Yeah, it's a little okay. in and out. All right, um, go on to the next question then. Okay, we lost him, so we're going to move on to the next question, which comes from Jeff Faust with Space News. Hi, good afternoon. A question for uh, Mike Serafin or Howard Q. Um, I know you're still looking at the data, but from the first look at the data, um, how well did the thermal protection system on Orion perform compared to the models you had before the flight? Uh, you can start, Howard, if you want, or I can... Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I would say that uh, it accomplished its uh, job, uh, returning the spacecraft uh, to the water. You know, again, I think uh, this is very important for us to collect the data. Divers are in right now getting some visuals of the heat shield and looked like the back shells were doing pretty well as well uh, for the TPS system or thermal protection system. So I think overall we're happy with the global performance, but uh, we're going to look at the data very carefully. We've collected a lot of imagery and other data on its way down, and uh, when we get the capsule back, it'll be uh, really important from an inspection perspective in terms of its overall uh, detailed performance, but uh, I would say very happy with what we've seen so far on the heat shield. Yeah, and, and um, Jeff, I would agree with that. You know, it's it's a little early to say because again, the uh, the peak heating period was coincident with the blackout, and we need to go look at the flight data recorders and see uh, what what the uh, the flight recorders told us uh, or uh, will tell us um, after after we uh, get that off the vehicle. But you know, just the first blush look at the vehicle, obviously it um, survived the skip reentry. And there was some charring on the outside of the vehicle on the uh, silicon oxide tape. We expected all that. We saw some hazing on the windows. We expected all that. Um, so initial indications are very favorable, but there's there's more ahead of us in terms of exactly understanding uh, what the uh, the reentry flight test told us. Thank you. Our next question is from David Curley with the Discovery Channel. Thank you, Jackie. I think this is either for um, free or for Seraphin. Is I know there's a lot of data to digest at this point, but are there one or two or three things that you can tell us that you'd like to change from one Artemis one to Artemis two? I mean, I'll just talk about the one one part, Mike, and you're happy to add whatever you like. I, I think I mentioned one earlier about our processing flow. I think there's things we can continue to work on of uh, everything we're doing on the front end to improve our timeline of getting the vehicles. Uh, stacked out to the pad, uh, do some of the unique Artemis II tests we're going to have to do. Uh, that I, I'd point that out from uh, uh, that stuff we have uh, under our control right now. Right, We don't need the data back from the vehicle to change that. Uh, we do have a structured lessons learned process that we'll go through that will gather all this information and factor into the Artemis II schedule. Um, but definitely the processing for me is the highlight. Mike, I don't know if you have anything else. Um, this is, it's really up to Jim, but the one change that I would like to implement for Artemis II is to put astronauts on board and send them to the moon. <laughs> in, all, in all seriousness, the uh, the vehicle performed um, better than expected. And um, yeah, I, it, it, that's that's the one change I would like to see. Next up, we have a question from Mike Wall with space.com. Thank you all for doing this, and um, Kim, congratulations on, on the successful flight test. Just a, just a quick question about the sort of road to Artemis II. We know it's going to be a couple of years. It's going to be a long road. What do you see as, like, the biggest challenges facing you to, to meet that 2024 launch date? Are there a couple items in particular, like the life support system development? Is it more like rocket production? What do you guys see as, like, the biggest hurdles facing you as you look forward to Artemis II? I think Howard uh, Howard probably has the the biggest perspective. I'll talk about um, the space launch system um, and the ground system also uh, together. Probably not challenges, but you know, getting the the rocket down there and together. Obviously, the engine section is down there. The core stage will ship next year, and uh, we'll put that together. Uh, the ground system folks have to put the crew egress system up. Uh, that will uh, that will be a, a big part of their schedule in the in the coming year. So those are I'd say for me on those two. But Howard, from an Orion perspective, your thoughts? 
Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, you know, we're making great progress on the crew module and the service module for Artemis II. Um, the teams have been putting all the hardware in, and uh, we're in the process of doing the testing, actually, at the integrated system level. And I think, uh, you know, to me, the challenges will always be, you know, we're, we're installing some first-time hardware that uh, after Jim agrees to put the crew on board, you know, we'll, we'll have uh, displays for the crew to monitor systems and operate the spacecraft, along with hand controllers, and also the life support system. And all those will be very important elements uh, for Artemis II. Uh, those are still ahead of us in terms of overall uh, integrated system testing and of course we have stacking of the crew module service module and and in the, the fueling of the of the spacecraft so all those will be ahead of us they're things that we've done previously and uh, I'm sure the team will execute them as we have on Artemis one and of course we'll also look for lessons learned Jim said earlier about looking for opportunities uh, to go faster from our Artemis one flow seeing where we can uh, improve upon and take those improvements and uh, get uh, the next mission off as soon as we can Thank you very much. Our next question is from Stephen Clark with Spaceflight Now. Uh, thanks for taking my question. I think uh, this is for Howard. Uh, do you have a tally of the total number of, sorry, do you have a tally of the total number of uh, components from Artemis One that will be reused? What's the exact figure and what types of avionics boxes are they? And then what happens if, some of these components don't pass the retest if you have to build something before Artemis II. What does that do to the schedule? And if I may, for Mike Serafin, um, are you going to be the mission manager for Artemis II, or will that be a new person? Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, there's uh, eight types of components that we're bringing home and from Artemis I to Artemis II. Uh, I'll just give you a flavor. Uh, the uh, IMUs, inertial measurement units, are, are one of those. The GPS receivers are another. The phase array antennas that's on the crew module will also be reused. Um, and relative to the retest, um, you know, we'll see what the conditions are, but we do have Artemis III hardware uh, that are available to utilize uh, for Artemis II when they're available. And so we'll look at those very carefully uh, going forward, and, and of course, uh, we'll do the testing and uh, make sure they're uh, ready for flight for Artemis II. And I'll turn over to them. Okay. Somebody else for the next question. Yeah, and uh, Stephen, thank you for the question. In terms of uh, uh, who the Artemis II uh, person is, uh, that is that is Jim's call, and uh, and uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll see what he decides. I'm I'm ready for a rest after this one. I look forward to uh, to uh, to going home and uh, and just. Uh, and, and take it, taking a little bit of a break here, but um, uh, we do have flight-by-flight -flight assignments, and we'll see what Jim decides. Well-deserved rest. <laughs> Our next question is from Manuel Mazzanti with Debate. Hi, thank you, and congratulations to all on an incredible mission uh, to NASA and its partners. I, I hope Melissa is still there on board of Portland. I, I want to follow up on a previous question. I understood that uh, the recovery timing of the average recovery timing uh, is two hours for uh, crewed mission. It starts from the from the moment of splashdown to hatch opening. Uh, if if that's so, is there any objective on trying to minimize that time? Thank you, yeah, Melissa. Do you are you still on? Do you want to try try to take that one? Otherwise, I'll take it. No, I've got it. Thank you. So um, for Artemis II, for crewed missions, the requirement is from splashdown to astronauts to med bay, two hours. We absolutely plan and expect to beat that with um, our training and our testing that we're going to be doing post-Artemis one. Yeah, the only thing I'll elaborate on that one is, and Melissa can correct me on this, is we have parallel recovery methods starting with um, crew on Artemis II. So, uh, we're preserving the option to do what they call open water extraction, which is is literally open the hatch out on the water, and and get the crew out um, uh, to a, a a small boat and then transfer them to the recovery ship while the capsule is still in the water. Uh, the uh, the other method is is literally just tow the capsule with the crew in it into the well deck. So that we're we're preserving both options to do that, and the recovery operations teams are prepared to do either of those. Thank you. Our next question is from Ken Kramer with Space Up Close. Hi, thanks for taking my question, and, and congratulations on all of you for a, for a fantastic job. Many of us have waited 50 years in the Apollo generation, and so you've, you've done that for both Apollo and Artemis, so thank you. 
Uh, my question for Bill Nelson is um, maybe what, what Kenneth Chang was asking too. Can you give us an update on uh, uh, Starship production, research, development, technology? Are they are they building hardware? Are they still designing it? Um, can, can you talk us tell us in some detail about that, please, for the lunar lander? I ask the question all the time of Jim Free. Uh, is the Starship meeting each of the benchmarks, the, the time schedules, and the answer comes back to me, yes, and in some cases, exceeding. Uh, I have uh, been down to Boca Chica. Uh, it is uh, a sight to behold how they are putting those Starships together and then the big booster. And their plan is that they're going to do a few test flights there. And uh, once they have the confidence, they will bring the missions to uh, the Cape. And until they get their permanent pad on the Cape, uh, they will launch from the one that they are constructing right now that is in the outer perimeter of pad 39A. And, um, you know, you're developing a new vehicle, uh, a new uh, rocket, and uh, you can expect some delays, but uh, thus far I'm told that they are on schedule. Their plan is to do an uncrewed landing uh, in 23, late 23, that's a year from now, and then to do the crewed landing in late 24. Uh, so slips are always possible because it's a brand new system, but uh, they have been quite impressive in what they have done with other systems. Thank you. Our next question comes from Zach Aubert with Launchpad News. Yes, Zachary Aubert with TLPnetwork.com, Launchpad News. First, congratulations on such an incredible mission, and thank you for the great live tracker and cameras. It really felt like we all went back to the moon together, which is awesome because space is better together and the views were expiring. Is there any time-sensitive instruments or equipment that are on Orion that need to be offloaded quickly? We know. There's a more set timeline for crews, but anything for the cargo or science as we see during missions coming back from the ISS. And for Administrator Nelson, over the last three weeks, for the first time in 50 years, we could look to the moon and say we can go there. There's a new Artemis generation that's making a decision on what their future would look like. Uh, Administrator, what encouragement or inspiration would you say to this new generation on why they should consider the space industry as part of their future? Thank you. You want to mention else? Yeah. You can do it. Um, yeah, Zach, uh, thank you for the time, uh, the question on time sensitive uh, instruments and payloads. Um, we do have a number of dosimeters on board the, uh, the spacecraft, both active and passive. Um, there are, uh, there's also one um, bio experiment payload that is on board that it contains a number of organisms, uh, yeast and fungus and, and some other, other uh, organisms that um, serve as basically an analog to help us understand um, uh, radiation exposure. So we've got the bioexperiment samples in the, uh, in the cockpit of Orion. We've got the, uh, the mare uh, uh, mannequin torsos that uh, one had a radiation vest on, one did not, uh, and we'll get baseline data from that. And then uh, there are other dosimeters in the cabin. So those um, will be removed as soon as we, as we can once we get the vehicle back to San Diego. Um, simply to basically stop the clock on those, um, and it makes it more difficult it, in terms of understanding um, what the results are the longer that they're sitting here on Earth, and there is some background radiation, there is some background um, uh, decay in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the experiments themselves, uh, so uh, that, that will uh, be done to stop the clock, but um, none of those, I would say, are, are kind of um, high priority in terms of the uh, the uh, uh, overall processing of the vehicle, we just, we just know we're going to get those off the vehicle and there's a plan to do that. 
the essence of your question was how do we get the younger generation to buy in to the Artemis program? And um, I would invite you uh, to come with me to any NASA center and talk to our interns. We hire a bunch of college interns. We're going to hire more, by the way. We're getting that in the budget. Uh, you will come away from that conversation so pumped uh, because those students will pump you up with their excitement about what they're doing and how they're contributing. I can't help but remember in the old days in the Apollo program, uh, the story was told about a ditch digger at the Kennedy Space Center and a reporter went over to him and said, describe your job. He says, I am helping to put a man on the moon. I think you will see that same kind of excitement and dedication uh, in the eyes and the speech of our young generation. Now, certainly with the success of this first Artemis mission, that is the telling of a story that has a plan uh, to going further out into the universe. And uh, that in and of itself is an exciting story. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are running up on the end of our time together. We have time for one more question. Uh, the last to close this out will be from Leo Enright with Irish Television. Uh, thanks very much. And I rather like the anecdote uh, about the ditch digger. I suspect Jay Barbary might have been involved in, in telling that anecdote originally. My question, though, is for Emily Nelson. Uh, presumably no relation. Um, and I wondered about the live shots we had of the other mission control, which was, of course, on the beach at Nordvik uh, in Holland. Uh, and I wondered how that worked. Uh, did, you, uh, did you find that this is something that you would be comfortable with if you had women and men aboard the spacecraft and you had to make sudden decisions? And I think I missed the very first part of your question. Could you repeat just the, the, the first part, please? Yeah, I was wondering about the service module control center in Nordvik. And uh, is that uh, somewhere that you would be comfortable? This is for Emily Nelson. Is this somewhere that would be comfortable for you if you had women and men aboard the spacecraft and you had to make sudden decisions? Um. I think he's asking of our integration with our remote control centers. Oh yeah, we have we have um, more than 20 years of experience working with globally distributed teams as we've been controlling the International Space Station, uh, and so um, really we have a number of years of experience in. Uh, in building those kinds of relationships and uh, making sure that all of our global teams are working in synchrony. So I would have no concerns over a, a distributed team executing these missions in the future. And especially as we bring in more international partners, as we bring in more commercial partners and partners across industry, I think you're gonna see an even more increasing diversity in our in our team globally. And, and we're really gonna leverage all of those opportunities to uh, make these missions successful going into the future. Thanks, Emily, and thank you all for joining us today. Our coverage of the Artemis One mission continues on the Artemis blog, where you can follow along for updates about Orion's journey back to the Kennedy Space Center. Have a great afternoon, and go Artemis. Range is clear for launch. Firing system armed. It is May 9, 1990. The place is Vandenberg Air Force Base in California.
Operations Manager Larry Tant is counting down to liftoff of the 113th flight of one of the United States' most reliable launch vehicle systems, Scout. Two, 